seeking after you, the, the one that loved them enough to die for them. Lord, help them as they learn and, un, and are taught today and be with Jackie as she does that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Well, good morning, church. I'm already dried out. When I was 16, I was invited to be part of an organization some of you know and some of you probably don't know, but I was invited to go to D. Malay. And if you don't know what D. Malay is, that's kind of Junior Masons. Um, so the, they had Rainbow Girls and that was the main reason I wanted to be in D. Malay. <laughs> but what was interesting about D. Malay was it was a gathering of people, it was a gathering of young people. We gathered at the Masonic Temple. It was at a temple, according to them. When, when you went into the, their inner sanctum, so to speak, they uh, can't tell you all the secrets. But when you entered in, they would have a, 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 there was a huge Bible. It was like our family Bible kind of style that would, would be right in front of you and you would have to go to the right or to the left of it. I mean, you were confronted right here. It was right, right center stage this huge Bible. And so it, it had a lot of elements that we would say make up church, as do a lot of other gatherings of people. I, I mean, there's probably not as many as there used to be. Uh, I mean, there was the Odd Fellows and Moose and Elks and probably others that I'm not even aware of. But these were people that gathered together of like mind, and a lot of them served and did good things. They, they, had, they did some moral things and some beneficial things into our culture. But it's not the church because it wasn't a holy assembly. We are the redeemed. We are a holy assembly, at least positionally. I'm not, I don't know about your behavior. I'll, I'll let you deal with that between you and the Lord. But that, that's how we are seen. We are a, a holy assembly. And there's a lot of verses that talk about, about our justification and our redemption and all those kind of things of what has taken place, what God has done in our lives through Christ when we put our faith in him and faith alone. Remember, we're called out of the world into what? Into Christ. We're in Christ. We are his holy ones. We are his church. That's what we talked about last week. What church was and what that means. A couple places in the Bible, instead of using maybe theological terms, it uses a word picture that we can understand where it says that we are taken out of darkness into his marvelous light or taken out of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Christ Jesus. We have a new kingdom. We are, in some ways, we have a dual citizenship. But our allegiance is to be to this new kingdom that we are now been put into in Christ, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his church. That makes some of the distinctions. That's why the Bible says in a few places that it calls us sojourners or foreigners or even aliens, depending on that. That's because now we're here. That's absolutely, you can see me, right? I'm here. It's not a mirage, not a figment of your imagination. Yet my allegiance, I'm actually in another kingdom. Even though I'm here in this world, I have been placed supernaturally and spiritually into the kingdom of God and into the body of Christ. So there's several things, and, I, and I've wondered about it. <laughs> I mean, when I first, I remember one of the first times I went to church, I wondered, why, why did they do that? I mean, I, I never had anybody, matter of fact, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on why we do what we do. But I remember going to a church only because I was, I was about 26 years old and 
a pastor stopped by and visited me and he invited me to church and just so out of respect I thought I'd go to church and they did all the things that you know you think that they did they obviously gathered and there was he preached from God's word and there was worship and there was prayer and there's all these things that took place and it was in Pateras which is kind of a retirement community in the 70s and so I still had hair and at that time I had a lot of it and I went into this little church that was mostly older people with white hair and not as much of it and they weren't sure what to do with me they didn't know the pastor invited me it was like everybody's going like what and then as I was sitting there it came time to prayer for prayer and how, how they did it, they took prayer requests. And so this 20, 30 elderly people, for the most part, all prayed for arthritis and surgeries and bursitis and Uncle Bob and somebody, all that kind of stuff. And I think, man, why do they do what they do? Have you ever wondered? Well, there are certain elements that make up church, or really, I think it'd be a more accurate way, there are certain elements that you see that take place when we assemble together. As see, assembly is required. We're not to forsake ourselves, the assembling together. And there's just certain things that take place when we do that. And I like to look at them. It's not, it's not like they're stepping stones or maybe one is is way more important than the other although some I, I think are they have a little more uh, centrality in a service but they it's more like the the ingredients in a recipe they're all necessary for it to come out as intended right you ever made a bad substitute thought you could stick something else in there and be okay no and so part of, part of what that is, is, is this connection. The body of Christ comes together. Now, we do that on Sunday, and I don't have time to preach on why we do meet on Sunday and not some other time. But, but it's one thing that you see all the time. In Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 2, you see it. You see it throughout Acts. It says, on arriving there, they gathered the church together. Now, you could change that. It could have been this. And on arriving, they gathered God's people together, those in Christ together, and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they gathered together. That was a common practice. Before there was a building, under persecution, regardless of the situation, uh, very common, the one thing, it was a common denominator that you'd see all over where, where the gospel went out is they gathered together. They came together and shared possessions. They came together and prayed. They came together and did a lot of things. And it's not only a common practice. I think one of the things that makes church encouraging gives uh, that ha can take place in the assembly that uh, in a sense can is a mentoring aspect of it is you notice what they were doing in, in Acts 14 they were reporting back everything that God is doing among them so there's these testimonies a little bit like the testimony we prayed for Barb and we think the Lord that God answered Barb's prayer. But there's other things. There's other things that people are doing here. They're sharing the gospel. They're doing this. They're ministering to people. And when we report that back, that's encouraging, right? Because we see God at work. You, you don't do that when you're on your own. When we don't assemble together, a lot of times we don't hear these reports. We don't know what's going on. When I talked about together this connection when I was giving those illustrations and metaphors last week it talked about the body of Christ like a family we don't look at 
a single man and say, well, look at that family. It's when there's more than one person together. Even the example of the bride and the bridegroom. We don't look at the bride by herself and say, that's a family until the bridegroom shows up and then it's a family. When it's living stones, it's not a building. It is just a rock by itself. We see all these indications of being together in there. The illustration of the body. We wouldn't look inside, see something that w was taken out of the body. If I have my appendix removed, the doctor doesn't hold it up and say, you want, you want your body? No, we don't see that as part of our body. It's when these things are together, when they're connected, when they're assembled together. There's a reason for that. Even Jesus, when he sends the disciples out, he doesn't send them out individually on their own. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? You can cover more territory if everybody goes and does their own thing. No, he sends them out two by two. And what did they do? They came back and reported what God was doing. There's nowhere you're going to find in the scripture that Christianity is about being an individual, being separate. It's always about Christ being the head and you coming back together. They come back together, and this is the term I've always used, they speak their native language. And it doesn't matter. I've been in worship services in Thailand and in India and in Africa. Our native tongue, since we have a new kingdom and a new allegiance, is to, to speak biblical and spiritual things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. That's our native tongue. If you want to know what biblical koinonia is, or what we just translate out fellowship, what makes it distinct from just being social I'm a social guy. I love to, where's the party? I love that. I want to be around people. I'd rather be with people. Being isolated, that's how you punish people, right? Solitary confinement. I don't want that. But there's a major distinction between being social and socializing than koinonia. And the main distinction is we speak our native tongue together. We speak of Jesus Christ, what he's done. We speak of spiritual things together. That's what we do. So it's always this place where we to come together and it doesn't have to be in this building and it doesn't have to be a certain size as Sue read and talked about even in prayer. Two or three can be a, a holy assembly. Amen? It's a place of proclamation. From, from the get-go. Not only that's what Jesus said was why he came. He, he, he's going to preach. Remember when he was out praying? I mean, if you look in Mark chapter 1, I mean, that's a wonderful chapter because he's healing all kinds of people. I mean, they're bringing everybody all through the night, probably as soon as the Sabbath. So probably Saturday night, as soon as the sun went down, when Sabbath was over, they started bringing everybody from the town to him to heal. And he, he taught and he healed all through the night. Then early in the morning, he went out and by himself, as was his custom, and he was praying. And his disciples were looking for him. And when they came and found him, he said, hey, everybody's looking for you. You think? They're looking for you. What, let's go back there. They probably wanted to build a building or something. That's what Peter wanted to do after the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, shouldn't we build some booths or something? He said, no, we're not going back there. We're going because I've been called to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Proclamation has always been central, right at the very heart of it. And it is, it is the gospel it is not only Christ-centered, it is God's word-centered. It's not just the Bible being on display, even a big one, even one that you have to go around, it's so big. It's being proclaimed, it's being taught. You're getting instructions 
from it. You know, it's interesting in our denomination because we believe in ministering to all sorts of ethnic groups and people who are marginalized and we've planted churches not, not just on the outskirts in the suburbs and in the nice areas, but in the, in the really rough areas of inner cities. They talk a lot of times about our DNA, our spiritual DNA is ministering to the outcast and the marginalized and disenfranchised. And that's true. That's, that's been our history from the inception. But it seems like they forget one thing, that John Wesley said this, because this is part of our DNA. May I be a man of one book, because that one book is all I need. And he meant of the Bible. That also is in our DNA. It is also what we believe. It is also the foundation of all that we believe comes out of what God's word says. We believe everything necessary to live a godly life, as it says in Peter, can be found in God's word. We don't need to add anything to it. Now, John Wesley wrote things. He read other things. It doesn't mean that, oh, you know, I can't read anything or hear anything. It's I got to be just of one book. He's talking about it being foundational, being central. It is what we are to read. It is what's being proclaimed. Because it's God's word that has the authority, amen? A preacher doesn't have any authority because how loud he can be. And I've heard some of them that think you're not preaching until, you, you know, the ceiling's shaking. Or how clever or funny or entertaining is authority. The authority comes from God's word, which is authoritative. Amen? And so it needs to be central. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to preaching and teaching. That's the instruction. So that's what we do. We gather. We have koinonia. You have teaching and preaching and instruction, but it's not intended to stay here, amen? See, it just kind of leaks out and ekes out into the culture. It's like a little yeast that this spreads through everything. That's how it's intended to be. That's the example the Apostle Paul talks about, the Thessalonica church, that, that you received it with gladness and you, it rang out. It just... It, like a big gong just resonated through the culture, through Macedonia and through Achaia, heard the gospel was proclaimed through those people in Thessalonica. That's what happens here. We go out. We speak our native language. People say, why are you so weird and different? Because ah, of Jesus. That's my peculiarity is I am a lover of God and his son, Jesus Christ, who saved me, who changed me. That's why. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And people get changed. People get baptized. And so we gather together and we proclaim the good news and Christ is central and his word is taught. And then through that, there's maturation that takes place. That's how we mature. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayer. I can't tell you how many times in my, even before I, I became a pastor, but now 30 years plus in ministry, I've heard people saying, I just wish we could be a New Testament church. And I think, well, do you, have, you re have you read the Bible? that most of the epistles are a corrective because they are knuckleheads just like us. There was sin in the church. There was problems in the church. It had to be corrected and adjusted and, and done with. Do you realize the number one thing that they did was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching? That's, that's foundational, elemental of it. We, we want these things we have in our minds. We've created what we think church is and we start saying things like that and you've probably heard things like that and yet those same people will not devote themselves to the very thing that the beginning church devoted themselves to. The apostles teaching, coming together, that fellowship, breaking of bread. 
That's how we mature. Matter of fact, in the great commandment, what were we told? To go into all nations. Right? Is that it? And teach them to what? To obey everything I have commanded you. Baptizing them in the name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But teaching them to what? To obey. Not just teaching you. See, maturation is just not you knowing stuff. Some of you know more stuff than I do. It's obedience. Remember when we were, we were talking a few weeks ago about spiritual growth and how hard it is to have a definition of spiritual maturity, what that really looks like? Because it's ongoing. It's a process that's ongoing. If I was going to give a definition in my limited, finite little gray matter, it would be this, a person who obeys all that God commanded him. Doesn't question it. Doesn't try to find for a, a loophole. Now, I think there's a loophole here, isn't there? Like, I don't have to give 10% because that's Old Testament. I'm just a cheerful giver. I don't give anything. And, and we manipulate and we massage and we do all these kind of things. No, they heard, they gathered together they heard the proclamation of God's word. They studied it for themselves and they applied it. They're not just hearers of God's word, but they put it into practice. They were obedient in that. That's why I think the Apostle Paul, if you look, if you look at the Apostle Paul's life, towards the end of his life, how does he describe himself? As the chief of sinners. Christ a trustworthy saying, and I believe he says that might be King James. Here's a trustworthy, trustworthy say, saying. Christ came to save sinners whom I am chief. That means he's a good one. There's places that the Apostle Paul talks about all the things that has happened to him and his credentials as a Jew and all of that. And, and he still says something like this. Not that I have attained it, not that I'm there, but I'm striving towards it. I'm still working on it. I'm going in the right direction. But in Corinthians, he says, follow my example as I follow Christ. See, not a perfect example. There's no perfect examples. If you're looking for a perfect example or a perfect mentor, you probably will never find one except for yourself and your own thinking. There's no perfect church. Same reason. Because as soon as we show up, there's sin in it. There's brokenness. But we can follow godly examples. I can't, I, I, let me just give you this testimony. More than probably anything that ever had an influence on my life, it was godly examples that helped me. Because I could read things or I could hear the preacher say things that I, I should be about this, and I didn't know how that, how do, how do I do that? In the world that I'm living in, with what's going on around me, how, how do I really do that? And it was by looking and watching and following in the footsteps of godly men and women that I determined and learned how to do that. And still doing. Because it's not that I've attained it either. Jesus in his high priestly prayer said, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. How do we grow spiritually? How do we attain this maturation? How do we mature? God's word. Can't do it without it. Won't happen. Will not take place. We have to be a people of the book. We have to be a people who study it, memorize it, love it. Next, next week, I'm going to be talking about spiritual disciplines, which even that brings up. We'll probably lose half my crowd now, but because that doesn't even sound like something we want to know. Disciplines, oh my gosh. Ew. But it's practices. It, it, it was practices that people did so that God could work in them and they could mature. 
And, and that's part of it. We read God's word for that reason. Uh, God, biblical knowledge really is the source of our unity and our maturity. That's what it tells us in Ephesians. Until we reach unity in the faith. It's talking about coming together. And in <clears throat> knowledge of the Son, that's that we learn more and more about Jesus God and God and become mature, attaining the whole measure, the fullness of Christ. That's growing up in Christ. We're, we're in him. We're grafted in him. We're in Christ. We've been adopted. We're part of the family. We're all those things. But we're now to mature. We're to continue on in that. And that is the basis of our unity. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. When we're talking about spiritual growth, there are babies and they're mature. There's everything in between. And the, the church isn't uniform. We're not uniform in that we all have to think exactly the same way or that. But on the basic tenets of the faith, we have unity on the truth that is found in the gospel. Our unity is based on this truth about who we are, a sinner saved by grace, who God is, all-knowing, has always been, who sent his son to die for us. We put our faith in him. All of that. That is the basis of our unity. And it doesn't make us uniformity. It's, matter of fact, you go back to that illustration in Peter about the living stones being put together. I, I talked about Lloyd Caton's dad making beautiful things from stones. It's not, it's not manufactured stones. They're cookie cutter. They're all the same. It's an assortment of shapes and sizes and densities and colors. And when it's done, it's this living temple, this building, God's building. We're different personalities. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different passions. We have different experiences. We're different places where we're at in our spiritual walk. Absolutely. But we have this unif unity based on the truths, the foundational truth of God's word. And it's a place of adoration. And I'm going uh, to drink some more. You know, some of these words, adoration, I was thinking adoration, exhortation, hallowed even, there's, we just don't, we don't really encounter those. And so I don't know that we really understand those. M maybe this way in praise. In, in Acts 2, it says, They broke bread together in homes, ate together, and were glad, sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all, all the people. Once again, they were they're meeting, and they were praising God in this adoration it's, it's been said that adoration is the loftiest pursuit that we can have because what adoration really is, is the right view of God. It is a view of God that recognizes that he is worthy. We think of worship, un unfortunately, we boil worship down to the three hymns that some church sings or our worship songs. And what we do with those we don't worship, we don't, you might not even sing the words if you don't like them. Not my song. They didn't sing, you know, bringing in the sheaves or whatever our favorite is. So we think, which is not biblical, we, we, we'll just pass. That's not worship, that's singing. Now some of those songs do bring adoration to God. They do praise God, absolutely. But make a distinction. We can have adoration in prayer, we are to have adoration in our lifestyle, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do. Go in there and read on the wall. We do to the glory of God because he is worthy. That's adoration. And I have noticed in my own life, I won't give anybody else an example, that I am easy to praise that which I love. I can praise my grandkids. I can praise my wife. I can adore them. Her 
Remember in Luke chapter 7, the woman of a bad reputation, and this is what he says about her, she loves much because much has been forgiven. Now, I might confess that some of you sitting here probably weren't as to the degree of a sinner as I was before you came to Christ. Maybe you weren't chiefs. Maybe you were just braves. But you were sinners. And when we sit down and percolate on that a little bit, when we let that germinate and incubate in our minds what should have happened to us, for a holy God to look on us and say, unworthy, sinful, I do not like sin, I cannot stand sin, sin cannot be in my presence, but I'm going to have a remedy for sin. I'm going to deal with that so that you can have a relationship with me. When we get to thinking that way and recognize who we really are and what we really are and what God is and what, what he really is, adoration should come up. It should just flow from us. Amen? I know I, <clears throat> I used, to, used to practice, especially early on, I thought, you know, I, people, some people pray for a long time. And I thought, gosh, I don't pray that long. So, you know, the acts, the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And, and so one of the things I did during the adoration part, I, <laughs> I went through the alphabet and tried to put a word on some kind of a, a a label on what I was thinking about God. You know, I just, God, you're awesome, and be, you're beautiful. And, you, you, you know, I just went through that. And it was not easy, but it was a good exercise for me to realize that I don't even have the words to express. But have you sat down and even taken the time to do that? See, being in Christ, being in the body is not just a cavalier tip of our hat to the Almighty. Oh, see me again for the week. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I sent up a couple prayers. See you next week. Colossians says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and song, from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. That's how our singing becomes adoration. When we're singing because of the joy in our heart, because of what Christ did and what God has done in our lives, not because it's your favorite song, not because it's in the hymnity and should be sang every week, but is an expression of what's going on in your spirit. And it's a place of exhortation. Now, exhortation is another one of those words. I, I never run into it, did you, in a workplace? Hey, let's go out and have some exhortation. Anybody? No. And so I don't think we understand it. Encouragement we, we get a little bit of, we get a little slice of it, a little flavor of it, a taint of it through that. Um, that encouraging, and obviously that's some, some reasons we're to meet together. Again, in Hebrews, you've heard it, do not give up meeting together, as some uh, in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. That's one of the reasons we gather together. That's one of the reasons we assemble, so that we might encourage one another uh, but I, I think I think when it comes to exhortation, we don't understand exactly what it is. I think some of us think it's uh, informing us. I want to read in Second Corinthians uh, chapter nine, just because it's uh, I think is a good example of this. This is the Apostle Paul in chapter nine. Now he's he's talking to the Corinthian church. This is about about giving. This is not why I'm saying it. But if you want to give, there's an offering in the back. Um, verse 1 says this. There is no need for me to write to you 
about this service to the Lord's people. Now the service he's talking about, he's coming and getting an offering that they're collecting so he can take it to Jerusalem. Did you hear what he said there? There's no need for me to tell you this. Why is that? They already know it. The exhortation isn't informing you of something that you do not know. It's beyond that. You know that. Verse 2, For I know of your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians. Exhortation doesn't mean he's trying to get you to do something that you do not want to do. He knows that they're eager to do it. They want to do it. But let me tell you something about exhortation. Sometimes we know about it, we're informed about it. Sometimes we really want to do it. But it doesn't happen. Can I get a testimony? In my life, let me, let me give you an example anyway. It's late, but let me give you an example anyway. I was fortunate enough as a brand new believer that the church was having what they called in those days a discipleship cell. It was a small group. I wasn't invited because I was a new believer and they didn't think I'd want to do it because it was a commitment. If you're going to be in this small group, you committed to meet every week, every week, no excuses, didn't matter if the Seahawks were even in the Super Bowl. Nothing mattered. It was a commitment for a year to be discipled together. So I asked them, why couldn't I be in there? I said, well, we didn't think you wanted to be in there. But I was in there. And part of what what took place in there was that we gathered together and through that, through this exhortation and urging and all of that that went on, I learned more about what it meant to be a believer. Now, it... it because I didn't know anything, it was there where I could see how people lived out their faith. This, this exhortation, when you think about it, there's things that we, we don't want to do, that we know that we should do, but a lot of times, you know, we have good intentions, but we don't have the follow through. And, and that's what it is. I was thinking, there's a lot of important playoff games right now. And I'm sure that the coach is doing some exhortation. He's reminding them, you know what? When we get down, there's going to be some clutch plays. And we're, when we're down and we, we're in the third down, this is your last opportunity or we're going to have to punt. And they only got four yards, but they don't think they can make it. What do they t- typically need to try to do before they punt the ball? The quarterback gets up there. And he kind of acts like they're going to do, the, the play's going to start, right? What's the intention? They're trying to draw him off sides. They're trying to get him to jump off sides. Do you think that's the first time those football players ever heard that? No, they've probably done it before. It's not reminding them something they didn't know. It's not information. It's remembering the follow-through. You said that you were going to stay fast. You're going to stay firm. You're, you're going to go through with what you said. In an example, the Macedonians hey, I'm sending some guys to, to be there with you. Don't embarrass me or don't embarrass yourselves by not being prepared. Follow through. Exhortation so we will follow through, not just to inform us or, or to tell us to do something we don't want to do. We have good intentions in that. There's the other side of exhortation, which we think about is more the encouraging one another. It says to encourage one another. That spur one another on. That's kind of lifting one another. Kind of be, we say, that's the cheerleader on the side kind of thing. That's who we might think of Bar- uh, Barabbas. What was his nickname? People of one book, right? He, he, was, he had a reputation of being an encourager. By his lifestyle, he was generous. He encouraged people. He told them they could do it. 
who brought Paul, who had a reputation of being like a ravenous wolf. The disciples didn't want anything to do with him. The followers of Jesus said, wait a minute. We know what this guy's like. He's putting people to death. I don't want nothing to do with him. It was Barabbas that went and brought him personally to them. He was an encourager. There's that side of it. And, and we need that as well. Amen? Because let me just say this. It doesn't cost you any more energy to express a good word to somebody as it does a negative one. And let me give you some food for thought. If the church was going to give you a nickname, what would it be? The encourager? The enforcer? The politician? And it should be a place of supplication. Do not be anxious about anything. About anything. About sickness. About politics. About anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now we have all kinds of prayers when we assemble. We have prayers in small group for one another. Might say that's intercession. We're praying on behalf of another. Or supplication. We're praying for, for God to supply our needs. We have invocational prayers where we invite God to be here in our presence. We have pastoral prayers. You might even have prayer. You know what? Maybe you've never prayed this pray, prayer, but I've prayed this prayer when I've said under preaching before. Somebody has said something, like I just said, that he had a reputation for being, being an encourager. And I prayed this way. God, make that so in my life. Make me an encourager, not an accuser. Because, see, being an accuser is my default switch. As soon as somebody irritates me, I can hear it click, just like a circuit breaker sometimes. Right back to the sinful nature and say, okay, that's a knucklehead. I'm, you're, you're written off. No Christmas card from me, pal. And I don't think I'm the only one. Remember when Peter was in prison? What was the church doing? Praying. They didn't apparently have much faith in his prayers because when they said, hey, Peter's at the door. No, it can't be. We're praying for him. But they were praying. When we used to have two services, there were times I had people that volunteered that they would be in one service and in the second service, vice versa, they would pray. They would pray for the service. They would pray for the, the preaching. They would pray for the people to receive what God is saying. I've had it in times in my life where I've asked somebody, when I'm there and I'm preaching, will you just pray with me? Pray during the service. Not that it sidelines you, but could you be offering up, shooting up little arrow prayers as you, as you see what's going on in the congregation? We pray together. See, these are all ingredients. These, these are not stepping stones saying that because I do these things, it's not a checklist, oh, I did this, 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 this. These are things we do when we gather together so that what we are putting together is pleasing and palatable and life-sustaining and brings God glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that... We are the church. And it, you've made it possible for us to assemble together for your glory, for our maturation, Lord, for koinonia, so that we can be encouraged when we're discouraged. So we can be encouragers like he, Paul tells the church in Thessalonica that remind people of Jesus Christ that he died and he rose again. And even those that are dead in him, he's going to come back someday. And when he does, the dead in Christ shall, shall rise. And it says, encourage one another with these words. Lord, make it so for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and we'll worship together. Mm -hmm.